Hey, I'm Tim. It's good to be back. And uh, it's time for Lightning Talks. And I think we'll dive right in. Um, first up, we have Loic Texera. Cool. Um, all right. So, like everybody, I'll start by sharing my screen, which I've never done with Zoom. All right. Hopefully, everybody sees my brother just now. Yeah, we got it. Cool. Uh, all right. So I want to talk about uh, the in international, oops, sorry, internationalization of the Whitetail admin because uh, we've had some talks about uh, doing it for the front end um, and also talks about accessibility. But uh, language um, is also another pendant of the accessibility. Um, and so to, I want to start by showing the Whitetail admin, which right now is in English, but unlike your front end that you will uh, control in your uh, code, where you will be able to uh, say, I support French and English, and there will be different mechanisms for people to switch between them, but you can control what they, uh, which language they can use. However, in the admin, um, it's all built in in Wagtail and you can um, come to your settings and uh, go to your language preferences and then switch to French and update and the whole interface is in French even though even if you don't have anything supporting it for the front end. Um, so um, sorry so what I want to go with is um, it doesn't get translated by itself. Um, actually, if we go to, it's another part, another uh, way you could contribute to Whitetail as well, if you're not too comfortable with um, coding. Um, and so if we go to the uh, documentation and to contributing to Whitetail, we are going to have a small section about translation, which is going to take it to Transiflex, Transifex, sorry. So if you click that link, you'll, uh, you'll be around, uh, well, you'll arrive on this one page and you can say help translate whitetail. Um, and then you, so you'll have to log in with either GitHub, an email, whatever. And, and then you will have to request access, I believe. I can't really remember the, the process, but you, you will say, I want to translate French, German, whatever. Um, and then I think on our end, we'll have to make uh, one little validation. But so you will end up on that, uh, on that page of Wagtail where you can see a list of all the languages which Wagtail is available in. Um, but as we can see right now, uh, maybe I need to refresh the page. I've done stuff in the meantime. Um, oh. oh no, all right. <laughs> I was surprised to, sorry for scrolling a bit fast, to not see French in the list of ready to use uh, languages, but that's because I untranslated some uh, strings just so I could translate them again for the demo. But yeah, so right now we actually only have three languages which are complete. Uh, some of them aren't that far, that is uh, probably just because of the 2.10 release which is about to come and the moderation um, pipeline adds a lot of new strings but some of them can really get some love. Um, so once you pick your language, you've been approved, you will, be, you will end up on this one um, page. Um, and you can see here, it's a bit daunting at first, there's quite a few panels here and there, but it's actually, we'll see, pretty simple. Um, so we'll have a few modules here, um, which actually reflect, if I can move the, how do I move the zoom thing? Oh, yeah, here you go. Um, which reflects the module in Wagtail with the exception that if you see here we have Wagtail admin it's actually the old name from the 1.x uh, release of Wagtail um, for compatibility reason the, the file still has the same name but we have admin core docs and if we go uh, over on GitHub we have admin here core document docs have been renamed but um, so that, that's an easy way for you to uh, 
probably pick a, a module you're comfortable with. If you know you've worked a lot with docs, um, you can just jump ahead and start with docu documentation translation to um, get used to it. And obviously I haven't uh, said it, but it's, it's good if you speak the language you're translating into. <laughs> um, so right now I, I went into the Whitetail admin uh, module and I have that first string, which is published in English. And so we have that two panes, uh, a list of all the strings to translate on the left. On the right, I'll have my translation panel and below we have some tabs. If you have a really wide monitor, uh, it will appear on the right hand side rather than below, but yeah, two to three panels. So here I can then translate. Oops, sorry, wrong keyboard. Um, so here I know we're in the context of a page, so in French it's going to have a, um, well, whatever, this is not the point of the talk, sorry. <laughs> and then I can save my translation. And uh, now it went to green and um, next release it will be picked up. Um, just on this uh, one interface, we can see here we have copy source string, which is going to copy everything for you. Uh, right here we have one word, so it's not that interesting but when you have really long sentences that can be interesting to just copy it and then replace a few bits we have uh, revert um, when you have made changes and that one is also quite interesting to add special characters so probably if you translating a language which has accents you probably have a way of putting it with your keyboard but you can otherwise access it here um, but there's also some other really interesting one like the nbsp the non-breaking space uh, which some language like French use around punctuations and stuff. So that can, it's really handy because that one specifically can be hard to do on a given keyboard. Um, and we'll look at the first tab of the panel below, context, because um, sometimes you don't really know where that uh, string is going. Um, so if we look here, we can see, so we're still in the Water admin module and we are in the action menu.py. So I can go over to GitHub and this is more for GitHub tips, but I could navigate all the way, but you can also press T, which is the file search on GitHub, paste it and I see I have white admin action menu. So then I can click on that file. And if I come back on the previous slide, that was line 64. So now I can press L to jump to the line, see on the line 64, and I can see it's actually the publish menu item. So if you know a little bit of the uh, intricate of Wagtail, you'll, uh, you'll know that's one of the button at the bottom of the page publishing, um, like the actions you have at the bottom of the page. So that's one way to sometimes get a bit more context. Um, after doing translation for the last few releases, um, there's definitely some pain points like this. Sometimes we really like in context for languages like in English it's just um, and actually I was getting ahead of myself I think that's a, that's a verb here but French will have notion of genders uh, for nouns that English doesn't have and sometimes we're really lacking that context um, of knowing what is being published which would influence um, how you write things so um, I've started a list of those things and I'll try to work with the core team to see how we can make this easier but um, yeah it's still there's still ways for you to get more context so if we continue here we have a slightly more complicated uh, uh, translation string um, we have a label here you can see that percent label s and one is just because that's the first one in that string the first uh, tag basically um, it's going to be to come and be replaced um, at runtime when the page is generated with uh, whatever label we're talking about. And here I can just simply click on it and it'll pop into my um, uh, below. Um, but what's great when it's used like this is maybe in French, it's not the case here, but um, it could come last. So you can rearrange things as you, as you want. Um, and also, if I don't do it, if I don't add it and save my translation, I'll have an error saying that some labels are missing. Um, so I can fix this. 
and save my translation and the error went away. Um, sorry, um, there's a little the underline here and the number on the side has nothing to do with Transifex. It's uh, I have the language tool um, plugin which helps with spelling and stuff. So it makes extra help with uh, the translation. So again, if we continue here, we have a different type of label, uh, which is, a, uh, th that's one of the pain points I was talking before and I might want, uh, want to discuss with the core team. I can't click on this one. I might still have a warning if it's not uh, in there, but more, the, the warning is not specifically about, um, oh, all right, here you go. Um, I know here, okay. I guess they changed it before it would just tells me it's missing the brackets, but not specifically number zero. But yeah, I can't click on this one. It's a, um, uh, yeah, it's not as useful as the previous one. And since I'm here, I don't want to type the thing again. I'll show you also there's a history tab. So I could come back here and see that there was one previous translation, which I can, there's the same copy icon use this and save my change and revert back. So yeah, you're not losing anything when you're just trying things. All right, if we continue here, we have another special type. Uh, you can see here we have a one and other. That's a uh, sentence which is going to be passed a number. And when the number is one, we'll be in that case. When the number is more than one or other, we'll be in that second case. So um, I was saying earlier, there's not much the distinction between gender, but we can have the distinction for uh, count number. Um, Got about 30 so. seconds left, my friend. <laughs> All right, so you have to fill both uh, before uh, to, to be able to save. Um, likewise here, we have tags like A tags. So again, you can click on them to put them on your string. Uh, what do I have here? Um, I was about to say we have comments, so you can comment here and discuss between with each other. And lastly, I'll finish on this. You have suggestion as well as your uh, site grows, oh, as the translation is filled in, you will have translation from all the strings, which might help you to translate. And likewise, you can save glossary items. So when you decide on a specific translation for a word, here we've discussed it on Slack you can define it. So after that, every time you have the word, you can see it's underlined here. Uh, so then you can click and you get automatically the translation that you had already decided previously. And here is a full view of the uh, glossary. And yeah, you can see you have the redirect as a noun, redirect as a verb, which does not translate to the same thing in French. Um, so yeah, that's a, also a very helpful tool to make sure you have consistency across translation. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, here you go. Oh. All right. Next up, we have Nick Pereira. Hello. Can you see my screen? Absolutely. You have till 321 or so, Nick. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, hi, my name is Nick Pereira. I'm a software engineer at Be Well Connected Health. Um, Be Well Connected Health is a company that wants to um, get a lot of uh, basically um, fragmented information from the healthcare space uh, and present it in a way that is coherent and easy to manage for uh, our users. Right. Uh, one of those um, one of those things that we're uh, going to be doing is sending a lot a lot of like targeted articles for our um, our our users. Like, for example, um, on monitoring your blood pressure for someone that has um, high blood pressure, right, um, and things like that. And uh, the one of the big problems that uh, we had, um, well, that BWO had, uh, is that they didn't have a good way to manage their content, right? Um, when I started uh, there um, a couple months ago, uh, the way they were managing their content was through a Google spreadsheet. So as you can tell, that can, that is, uh, that can be very error prone uh, from copy errors and things like that. Um, and 
they wanted to uh, have a better solution, right? Uh, but the approach was a little, um, I guess, not not over, not really well um, taken, uh, because they told the content editor, "Hey." what do you want to be your content management system, right? And uh, they only looked at it from the perspe perspective of content. Um, and and I saw what was happening. And um, I basically wanted to share my experience to uh, let anyone know if anyone's had to face something like this. Um, essentially, how to make a very compelling argument uh, to your company. Um, so I looked at the problem and I uh, considered it from a bunch of different perspectives. I, I saw the content editor perspective, I saw the developer's perspective, and I saw the business perspective. Um, my experience with Wagtail before I was working at BeWell was uh, um, with a travel e-commerce website um, for the past four uh, years. And um, and I learned a lot about basically Wagtail CMS. And I was able to convey um, this with a proof of concept. I made a proof of concept with Wagtail and I made a proof of concept with another uh, vendor that they were considering, which was a cloud CMS. And um, I looked at the requirements from the content team. The user of this application was gonna be the content editors, right? We already had a really big content library. Um, so Wagtail has the ability to import all of that. Um, these are all basically the requirements that they presented. Um, and then I also took at the engineering requirements. We needed it to fit within all of our current stacks. We run uh, Python, uh, Django stack. Um, we want it to be uh, scalable, customizable. Basically, a lot of the things that Wagtail provides, right? And so I was able to present this to um, my engineering team, uh, my content editor team, and, and the business team, and um, I uh, like. I think if you can approach it from all these different angles, and not give the responsibility on just one angle, because the content editor was like, "Okay, I really don't know much about what needs to happen," um, and it. She was kind of basically given this responsibility without really knowing anything about content management systems. And so I guess my point is it's really a team effort, you know? Um, and I, I just wanted to, I guess, mention, well, Wagtail is a really exceptional choice. So I appreciate the creators and the contributors of the project. So thank you. Um, and, and then also I did a demo this is where I did the demo. Um, this, uh, these slides I'm showing are basically just a shortened version of what I talked to at my company. Um, but uh, Tom was actually interested in, uh, in, in how I presented this and talked about this. So I was like, okay, I'll do a short little lightning talk. Um, I can show really quick. Uh, this is uh, the, um, the landing page to, that I did. Um, but what I did was I got their current content creation thing and this is for example a uh, an, uh, a challenge we call them challenges right um, and I saw everything that they had in their current templates and I basically turned them to content blocks as you guys are familiar with and I showed um, the content editor that they can rearrange this however they want with the stream fields and everyone loves it um, they love the customization I made I put the little logo here for them and I changed the colors um, the colors were a little difficult to do, like um, these buttons are not very consistent. I still got to look at that. Um, but that is my, uh, my experience with suggesting Wagtail at my company. And then my last uh, slide is a plug for BeWell um, that we're hiring. So if anyone is interested in working at a healthcare um, uh, systems company and um, we are, we are based in uh, Maryland, in Austin, but we are all remote right now, obviously, because of COVID, and we're hiring all these people. So that's my presentation. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks so much, Nick. That was fantastic. Does anyone have any questions?
will these positions be remote forever and ever? <laughs> hmm. Well, <laughs> we don't have an office. We actually got rid of our office, so for the foreseeable future. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're in Baltimore, and our engineering is mainly in Austin. Cool. Thank you. Next up... We have uh, someone reached out to me who was like, is it okay to do something off topic and mentioned it to me? And it sounded more awesome than anything else I'd ever heard about uh, since COVID started. So without further ado, here's Struther Scott. How are you all? Can you hear me okay? Can you turn up a little bit? It's a bit quiet, Struther. Where do I turn that up? Can you hear me now? It sounds oh, like it's off cool. a little bit. Built-in microphone. Is your microphone uh, a block by chance, or is there something? Mac, MacBook Air. Is, uh, it, is it blocked by another item by chance, or? No idea. Can you hear me at all? We can hear you. You're just quiet. We'll, we'll just turn up the volume. It's not really key that I um, talk for this thing. Um, share screen. Okay. Now I can't hear you at all. I don't know about everybody else. Can you hear me now? That's I'm a I'm a. Can you hear me at all? Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you just a little bit, but uh, we can turn it up when we make the video. I think so. I'll if talk, everybody, I'll, I'll talk. You know how to do it. You know how to talk. I I know. How, I'm a retired banker. I've been doing Wagtail on two websites for four years. I'm not a programmer. I've got a coder that helps me. I got on up Upwork. We live on a farm out in Goochland, Virginia, near Richmond, and I've become a beekeeper the last six years. I've got honeybees. And this is an example of a field I have uh, where um, I'm growing Clemson clover because the main thing that, with my bees where we live is trying to get a, uh, plenty of food for them. So this is what Crimson clover looks like up front, up close. This is a, this might be Billy who's here with me now. This, this is a honeybee hive. Brother, we're not seeing your screen. Uh, unfortunately, your, your screen isn't being shared yet. If you look at the bottom, did you hit share screen? It's in, if you, if you, if you mouse over where the video is, there'll be a green share screen button I've hit in that. the middle That's of the bottom. That's what I'm looking at. So I, Desktop says exclamation point. Hmm. I think, yeah, then you have to hit another button that says OK or share screen or something. Open system preferences. Zoom. I think it says share at the bottom right. It's a blue button at the bottom right. That uh, says I think I, are, you're on a Mac running Catalina. I think for the first time he has to give permission for the screen share to be able to go off of Mac. Shall I drop in and do mine while Strother does the re Oh no, it's working. Oh, there we go. Perfect. All right. That looks fantastic. Yes, bees. I'm here for the bees. This is my crimson clover field with my dog. This is what crimson clover looks like up, up close. This is a honeybee hive. A typical hive has got 10 frames. And here one frame has been pulled out so the guy can look at the bees. And this, this is interesting because people always ask about the queen. Can you see the queen is the guy right here. But the, all the, all the, the boys and the girl bees have got bands on the back and the queen's got a long tail. And the bottom, just, just below the middle on the left. Uh, the, the, um, so this is my beehive from a distance and these are my flowers I plant in front of the beehive to give them food. And this is what the hives look like up close. And so, um, one day the phone rang at my wife's office, my wife's phone, and said a friend had a, um, got to change, a, um, a friend called to say, I've got a swarm of bees, can you help me out? So this is, my, I went to visit the bees, and this is the, uh, Ken Law. that's Ken Law. I was going, uh, this is his backyard, and I'm going to approach the swarm, right there. 
two feet off the ground, easy to get a box underneath. And so um, I put my bee suit on and I went under the uh, hive with, with a, I got under the tree with this um, hive that's got only five frames that to leave room for the bushes to fall down and went to work uh, to, to position it to, to drop the um, swarm into the hive. And this is where the queen comes in. How do you know you got the queen? Well, the, the reason the bees are all tight around that is because their full job in life is to keep the queen happy. And so they're all right there trying to keep her warm. And so this is cutting away the bushes to drop it in. And now I'm starting to drop them in a little bit. And this is my wife's video. <laughs> Some of them are already down in there, it says. So here's the, I've cut more branches away and I've got most of them in the box. Still getting in the box. And now I'm finished. And so now there's the, there's, I put some frames in to make it tighter. And I'm going to put a top on it and clamp it up together. So now the bees are trapped and they can't go away. And so there I am taking the bees back to um, my farm to put it on the beehives. And, and th th there they are, the, the one in the middle is the, is the swarm, the single one. And I've got two more to show you. This is, a, this is a month later in May, a bunch of bees came and landed on one of our hives. And, and, and that's another swarm, it's not my bees. And the guy that helps me, I uh, took a box and, and, and brushed them off into the box. I think this is a video. That's a video. So here he is collecting the bees. Billy points out, I should say that swarms are very docile, whereas hives, if they get mad at you, but these bees are, are desperate for help, and so they don't, they don't want to try to sting you at all. So he's dropping the bees in the box and, put, and putting the top on it. And, my, and there are the bees in the box. There's just uh, one frame worth of bees. And we had to feed them after that, so we put some honey on the frames to make them something to eat because they were in a new territory, didn't know where the flowers were. And this is my final video. Uh, this is in Massachusetts. My son's girlfriend's father is a beekeeper. This is his collecting a swarm in his house. The swarm is up in the tree. You can see it hanging six feet above his head and he's already on an eight foot ladder. His friend has got a rope down there. How to recapture a swarm. <laughs> <laughs> so guess what happened? <laughs> Is he going to shake it or cut it? Oh my God. All right. I don't think I want to be near those bees. Yeah, that concludes my talk. <laughs> nice. That was fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, Strother. <laughs> really cool. I was I was scared the whole time, but it was really cool. I'm glad that I'm behind a screen and not there. Uh, better you than me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Strother. Oh, that was amazing. Fantastic. All right. Uh, next up, we have uh, a newcomer to our community, I believe, uh, Tom Dyson. <laughs> right, okay. I'm glad, um, I'm glad that Strother went to off Wagtail for that topic because my, my lightning talk is also not, nothing to do with Wagtail. Uh, it's the, the title is Micro Adventures. And, um, this person on the screen is called Alistair Humphreys. He's a British guy and uh, he's an explorer and he's done some amazing trips. He's cycled around the world. Uh, you can read about him. He's like rode across the Atlantic, all the, all the crazy things you can do. And he gives talks to people about exploring. And he said one of the questions he gets most frequently is, uh, 
uh, it's not really a question. It's a, a, an observation. People say, uh, you, what you do is so amazing, but I just, I just wish I was able to do that if I didn't have a job or a family or having to pay a mortgage. And, um, and he had this so many times that he wrote a book called micro adventures. And the idea is that you can still have adventures, but, um, they don't have to be like changing your life and uh, taking two years off to, to walk across the Sahara. There are things that you can do like locally to you in a short amount of time. And, uh, and, uh, I, I bought this book and I've been feeling a bit inspired by it. So I, I, I carried out my first micro adventure before coming to, to Wagtail space. So I live in Oxfordshire in, in kind of uh, center of England and my parents live in East Sussex, which is on the, in the South coast. And we were coming down anyway, because it was my mother's birthday and, uh, and I thought I could cycle. Um, so I used an app called commute. This shows the route. Uh, it's about 230 kilometers at the towards the bottom of the screen. You can see the, the elevation profile. So this shows the hills. And, uh, this one here is something called Christmas common, um, which is quite a famous steep hill. And then here we have the North downs, which is a big area of land that goes, uh, just South of London around here so i so i made my route and uh, i have a new bike which i'm really in love with uh two of the things i like about it it's 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 made of steel which is makes, makes it quite heavy but it's also uh it's steel is is has a bit of a kind of flex this mythical flex and uh, also the it has um it allows wide not the steel but the, the design of the bike means it supports uh, wider wheels than usual so you can uh, you can take it some places that, that you might normally take a normal road bike. So I've loaded it up and uh, started my ride. And the app I showed is something called Commute. It's a bit like Google Maps, but for, for cyclists and, and runners and walkers. And um, I, I set the touring option, but Commute gave me some pretty gnarly routes. And this is the start of one. I was a bit surprised when I found that I had to go through this field. And the field then turned into this, which is, uh, I looked at later on the maps, called Stony Lane. And I think Commute probably just, it uses this, uh, like uh, old data and I, this probably was a Roman road 2000 years ago and it's still marked on the maps but uh, I don't think anyone has walked down this for years let alone cycled down it so anyway by the time I got here I, it was too late to turn around so I just had to keep pushing on and pretty soon I had a puncture uh, which I managed to fix that was okay and it was a long day but uh, the exciting bit happened really at the end so I did this across two days and uh, after the end of the first day I was halfway and I was at that second peak I showed the the North Downs and um and that's where I spent the night and uh, something that Alistair Humphreys talks a lot about is this idea of um uh, just kind of sleeping out and uh, this the, what you can see just on the other side of my bike is a, is a bivy bag I don't know if that's that word is also used in in uh, elsewhere around the world but it's just like a uh, a thin waterproof covering for your for your sleeping bag and uh, it's obviously very lightweight to travel and it means you can you can camp very quickly it's actually not it's not strictly legal just to, to camp in a field anywhere in england you can in scotland but not in england but generally people say that if you if you arrive after dark and you leave before light no one sees you and you you know you don't leave anything behind of course then uh, then it should be okay so so i, I lay down and uh, i did feel a bit nervous like you know maybe there'd be badges or a deer or something snuffling around and there was definitely a lot of snuffling at night time but I, I slept pretty well um uh there was that was me just before i went to bed and um but the best thing was in the morning and the south downs and i i got up at 5 30 and uh, had this incredible view this is zoomed in a bit but this is over the, the skyscrapers of london so from a big distance and uh I carried on cycling and, you know, you have this, especially early in the morning, this magical experience of these high up roads with no traffic, no people at all, just a lot of animals around. And uh, this is a photo from near the end. So um, nothing, no, no more kind of mishaps or anything. But I think the thing that struck me about it and that um, I feel uh, like validates this concept of micro adventures is that uh, it's how, su how surprisingly easy it is to go from thinking about cache invalidation and the benefits of static site generation over server-side rendering to suddenly like just worrying about movement and food and sleep and uh and i found it a very refreshing experience and uh i mean I, yeah because of various commitments i'm not going to be able to do it that often but uh i really like the idea and uh, i recommend it that's me thanks tom
Yeah, I know there are quite a few cycling enthusiasts in our community. I, I'm not at the level of our of our next speaker when it comes to cycling enthusiasm, but I put uh, quite a few miles on mine every year. <laughs> so that's a good lead-in for our, I believe, final lightning talk of the day, which is my friend and colleague and fellow cyclist, Ryan Sullivan. Hey. So, nice shirt. Thank you. So one quick question before I begin. Um, I noticed that your bike, the, the pedals in the right position, the valve stems are lined up with the logos on the tires. This is bike vault material. I was wondering if you uploaded this to the GCN bike vault. I, I didn't, no, no. Please I think send me you said. <laughs> In case anybody's wondering what we're talking about, there's a British cycling show on YouTube uh, where they judge people's pictures of their bikes. It's actually pretty fun if you're into that sort of thing. I'm going last, so I figure I can uh, add, add live a little bit. This is actually going to be pretty quick. Um, okay, let's see here. Let's start out with... I, is, I think everybody here is familiar with the idea that um, Wagtail has a forms element built into it and uh, our forms um, sort of functionality built into it. And that's pretty neat, um, but it, it lacks a little bit of functionality in sort of letting you freeform create uh, forms and save their contents. And this is a cool little package that somebody created. And one of the contributors is actually uh, this guy, it looks like. <laughs> um, can you guys see my screen? Yeah, we got it. Good. Yeah, we're all good. Okay, good. So I'm not getting a visual feedback on that. Great. Um, and so I installed this and I tried using it and I thought, this is great. And just I'll give you a quick walkthrough of what it does. Um, so when you're on your Wagtail site, you can go to uh, the stream form section and then it'll let you create a form. And so you do that by clicking add form. I'm going to go ahead and open up this one I've already created. And um, I'm sorry, this is running uh, really slow right now. You just have to forgive that. We've got most of this, most of my tabs preloaded, so you won't have to wait, but uh, I didn't preload this one. Almost there. Anyhow, what you're gonna see is that you can create a form, and that form is, um, that form is a instance of a, a Django model, and it holds a, a list of fields that should be shown on the page so that you can um, fill out the form fields on the page. So this is taking too long, I'm gonna move on. So anyhow, um, I've created three pages, and these three pages have three different sort of types of, of using Wagtail stream forms. This, this um, package is called Wagtail stream forms. I'm just going to make sure that my server is running because if that's the reason this is failing, that's not good. Yeah, it's running. All right. Um, so anyhow, this is what it would look like if you were to... If you were to use the base uh, Wagtail stream form, um, what happens is you... you um, here we go. This is what it looks like when you are setting up a form. So you put in a title, a uh, slug, you decide what template you want to use. I'm just using the default template here, um, some success fail messages. And then the cool thing is you put in, you can choose fields and you're just using stream fields to generate fields. So I have some radio buttons here that I want to select from with the options A, B, and C. And when you see that rendered, it looks like this. Here's a field and here's an option that you can choose. And if you submit this, ideally, it will save this submission to the database. And that's pretty cool. So you can generate these forms using Wagtail um, stream fields, you know, pretty much on the fly. Um, in and of itself, that's super neat. But what we at Words want to do is we want to uh, be able to generate, um, I'm not entirely sure what just happened, but it worked, okay? <laughs> I promise. Um, and we want to be able to generate uh, something like 1,800 forms, 1,800 unique forms with the unique sets of input. And then we want to also be able to programmatically generate forms on the fly 
and do all sorts of interesting things because sort of our bread and butters, uh, we have a lot of forms. And so what we said is, we don't really want to go the path of having one of these uh, form model instances for every single um, form that we create. And we don't want to have to go and create the form here. And then the, the workflow is you create the form here by clicking add form in the upper right. And then on a page, you go and, sorry, this page. So this is a, an example page where you would go use the form. You then go and in the page, choose from this drop down, the drop down list the form that you've already created. So this is a listing of all of your form instances and you click one and then that's how it renders this form on the page. So just to be, just to, to really drive that home, if I have 1800 forms, I'm gonna have 1800 rows on this page or I'll have some pagination, but still 1800 um, instances of, of forms. And then I will have a drop down list here of 1800 options and then um, I'll have to create 1,800 pages, and for each page, choose the correct form option here, and then my forms will work. Okay, that totally works, but could we do better? So what we looked at is, well, can we eliminate the concept of the form um, model and just put the whole thing inside of a stream field? And we hacked it all together, and it turns out the answer is yes. And so this is an example of um, our hacked up code where we said, Instead of creating a the form in the in the uh, form model, we are just choosing the form fields on the fly here um, inside of inside of the stream fields uh, stream field. So like I can just come in here and say, you know what? I want to have a drop down field. It's going to be called my drop down field. and it'll be required and option A, option B, right? And then if I save this, so before I save it, you can see this was that page before I saved it, I have text filled and some options here. And now when I save this, Tim, how am I doing on time? You have about one minute left. <laughs> Thank you. So when I save this, if I refresh this page now, you'll see that now I have a couple more options here. I, have a draw, I should have a drop down on this page. Come on, run server. There we go. So now I have this option with options A and B. And the cool thing about this is, if I put, fill in these fields and I submit this, I'm going through the, I'm going through a, uh, form validate. So this form is actually getting grabbed um, upon submission and going through the same validation. So all the form elements are being pulled out of the stream forms. Um, a bound form is created and validate is run against it. And so if I do something wrong here, like I think that I said that this checkbox field is required um, and I submit it there, I should get an error message saying, no, uh, how about this one? I think this one is required. There you go. I get an error message saying, nope, this is a required field. So this totally works. Where it sort of falls apart for us is that we wanted to do something slightly more complex. Um, and here's an example of slightly more complex. So we have this idea of, um, I won't even go into what all of this does, but um, our forms have hierarchical form elements where we have more forms within forms. Um, and because of the way that, like HTML forms by their nature aren't hierarchical, stream fields and stream forms are still just black magic to me. And so like, this is the sort of, we've reached the edge of the ability of me to hack, right? So- By the way, pause right there for a second and you can see in the comment there that it says the value that will be passed to SAS if this option is chosen. So speaking of being on the border of sanity, yes. Yeah, yeah, border this. of sanity. So just to give you an idea of, um, of what we did to make this work, and yes, I am using Windows. And no, this isn't a Mac, I'm actually on a Lenovo, but usually I use Windows on a Mac. Um, 
what we did is we created um, this big fat stream for stream block. I'm scrolling to the top called words form stream words form block and words form block actually has all of the functionality that you would have found inside of the um, I don't know where I put it. I had it here to show you, but inside of the uh, the abstract form that ships with words, uh, sorry, with Wagtail stream forms. Um, so we basically pulled all of that functionality out of the form, got rid of the form object, and just dumped it all into the stream block, and then did some fancy wiring up of the hooks in order to actually make all of this work. That fancy wiring up of the hooks, um, basically, it's complete hacks over the stream field because. Once we even figured out stream fields, then previewing them was a whole different story because we had to deal with an entirely different model of how the data is represented, which I'm sure there's like an efficient way to do that, but I don't know it. <laughs> so yeah, this is where we got. And I think this is really cool. I'm ready to get this. Um, I'm, I've got two sort of initiatives here, two goals here actually at this point. My first goal is, um, I mean, clearly the thing works with the, as a, as a, you know, form model less um, form builder in Wagtail. And you can put save hooks, like submit hooks, so you can do whatever you want with the data after it's been submitted and validated against the bound form. That totally works, and I want to sort of get that back out into the open source community, because that code sits here and it's running and it totally works. But then the next step is how do we actually expand upon this a little bit more and handle those hierarchical um, uh, forms. And then, you know, as a second delivery, then get that back out into the community because I think that that would be even cooler. So thank you for your time. I'm sorry I went a little long.